All right. Five minutes late. It happens. It happens. All right. So, a couple things. Lab today. We have presentations to give. Do y'all know who's presenting? Sure? Yes. All right. All right. Just got it. We're going to present today. Uh, make sure you send me your presentation so that we can get posted, um, or so I could download it and open it up on the front computer. Uh, this week we have exam on Friday, lab practical on Monday. All right. Where we go with this, it just kind of depends on how much we get through. All right. So we'll definitely kind of mark an ending point. Uh, at least on Wednesday, we'll have an end point. Uh, and that means our quizzes, deadline to do the quizzes are, you know, first thing Wednesday morning. I think I set it at like 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Uh, they all disappear at that point, uh, and the keys become available at that point. So you'll have access to them. Don't forget the life cycle data. I change it so you can take it up to three times. Um, and for our lab practical, we had, we had lab quiz number four. Uh, that was a nematode stuff. That practice part of that is the practice quiz is now avail available. Unlimited times. Uh, you can take it. I'm not recording any grades on there. Uh, and then quiz number five is this week. Uh, covers more of the nematodes. Uh, and I have that set for Monday as becoming unlimited practices. So kind of help you prep for, for the practical. All right. So this is where we're off. we left off. We've got eight weeks left. Eight weeks left. So we are at pinworms. All right, this is family oxyuridae. All right, it's the only known endoparasite with haplodiploidy. So here you have your males develop parthenogenically, so unfertilized eggs is when they develop. But then the females are diploids. All right, so they develop from the fertilized eggs. And the worms that we're talking about is Enterobius vermicularis. This is human pinworm, uh, also called the seat worm, as you'll see from its life cycle we uh, described, really has this prominent pharyngeal bulb. Uh, it possesses some cephalic alley. You can see the slight wings on here. Uh, our slides, not all of them are super great. So you have to really look through the different sides to find ones where you can really see like the pharyngeal bulb uh, clearly on these. All right. Now, this is atypical because it's not, normally our parasites are in these subtropical regions. That's where we typically find them. And they're typically more concentrated in the poor areas, the poor socioeconomic classes. Usually they have lower hygiene. They're usually eating a wider range, range, a wider range of food items that might not be at you know, super, uh, super standards, hygienically standards, which all contributes to the increase in transmission. Not so with pinworm, it's going to hit everyone across all economic classes. So let's go through the life cycle. Hopefully you see why. So with our life cycle, our host is a human. That's why it's called human pinworms. Enterobius vermicularis. Our adult worm is going to be uh, basically in the intestine. All right, it's just going to wander up and down in the intestine. It's not really restricted to large intestine or small intestine like a lot of our other parasites. All right, so our adult females are going to drop eggs. are going to drop eggs, and the eggs um, are going to come out, and they're either going to be, you know, in the feces, or they're 
they're going to stick to the skin around the, the, around the anus, the perianal skin region. That's a question in feces. It just kind of depends on, on where we're, we're, you know, what's going to take place. But inside of our eggs, you're going to have the J1 develop. You're going to have the molt to the J2. Then you're going to molt to the J3 stage, all inside of the egg. All right? This development requires oxygen. That's the reason why the eggs have to get out. They have to get out, they have to get exposed to oxygen, and then it's going to develop. You're, the eggs are going to mature to the point where you get the J3 inside of that egg. All right? So then it's going to be these eggs with the J3 that get consumed. All right? They get consumed. Why do they get consumed? A couple different reasons. You can imagine that individuals that have lack proper hygiene, that don't wash their hands, and you get the eggs that get caught on their fingers, underneath the fingernails, and hit by the fingernails, transmit that way. That's entirely possible. Or it gets transmitted to some food. You then eat the, the food. But in any case, we now have the egg that hatches, releasing J3 in our intestine. All right, J3 in the intestine, J3 molts to the J4, then J4 molts, develops in the adult, and we're still in the intestine. Now, this seems like a simple infection, right? But it actually gets a bit more, a bit more complicated, because if you have this egg, and it's on the perianal skin, it develops, there is a chance that this egg will hatch hatch and the J3 will now enter the human via the anus. This process is called retrofection or retroinfection. You'll see it spelled a couple different ways. So retrofection or retroinfection. So here you have the adult worm or, or the eggs that came out. Eggs hatched on the perianal skin. They were there. They developed to the J3. It hatches. The J3 then moves around, enters the anus. It's right where it needs to go continues development. So it didn't even, even have to jump host. Just whatever host was initially infected, they can be reinfected by staying J3s. But there's one other aspect, and this is why you get called C1. So you have your adults, as a human. All right, so the adult exits, and now we have the adult on that perianal region of the skin. All right, when they get out here, now they will deposit eggs on this region. Now, while they're out there, they are going to cause some skin irritation. What happens when skin gets irritated? What's that? Inflammation. You get inflammation, and then what's the response? Scratching. 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 Scratching picks up eggs and transfer it. All right, but the other thing is with these eggs, that they are also light as dust, and this is one of the reasons why it's kind of a, hits all economic classes. You have one individual that gets it, you get eggs that are on the perianal skin, or get hit up, brushed off with your hands, or whatever, right? If they go airborne, 
they're just basically going to float in the air, which gives the potential for accidentally consuming it. Now, we're not there gulping air, but you can imagine if you breathe in some of that dust, it gets caught in the mucous membranes, ciliary action in the lungs kind of moves things up to the throat, you cough and swallow, voila, we're back to the intestine. All right, so we've got a couple different ways uh, in which our host can, can be infected. So in this case, this retrofection, that individual that was serving as a definitive host, now is just repeatedly reinfected by the same type of parasite. Questions? So retrofection or retroinfection, here, this is that process where nematode eggs hatch on the skin and then the juveniles re-enter the body to complete development. All right, so the eggs get out, they hatch, and then J3s go back in. Or you could also have a female that leaves a host, oviposits the eggs, uh, and then the eggs will hatch. Or our last bit, and I didn't really mention this, but the, the female gets out and dies, dries out, and then burst, and you know, basically all the eggs in the uterus will, will now have a chance to develop. This is why when you have, when you suspect a child has a baby, I should say, has a pinworm infection, one of the things you could do is, you know, first thing in the morning when you change the diaper, clean the diaper, you can put a piece of like scotch tape, you know, cellophane tape, <laughs> right over the perianal region and pull it off. If there are nematodes, there are pinworms, which normally would they, they would, from what I've heard, they would typically come out in the evening at night, but you would see them on that cellophane tape. Um, and then as we said, the eggs are super light. They are characteristic. They tend to be flattened on one side, all right, but they are light as air. So if one individual of the family has a pinworm infection, normally they're going to treat the entire family for pinworms. They will assume that everyone will have it because it is that easily transmitted. All right. Good. All right. Epidemiology. A single infected individual can contaminate an entire home or a school. Uh, this is why it's just one of these diseases where daycares really want you to, to tell them if the child comes down with pinworm. Because if your child has pinworm, likely other ch children in that daycare setting have pinworm as well. All right. These eggs are going to be light as air. They get going to cling to things like curtains and walls and carpets tables, etc. They're going to stick there and it gives uh, a chance for kids like this to be playing with their hands and then put their hands in their mouth, which now transmits the eggs. Now, these things can dry out. The eggs are susceptible to desiccation, so lower humidity levels, less likely to, to have, you know, severe outbreaks, but these eggs are also resistant to, des uh, resistant to disinfectants. So, Great disinfectants. Think you're cleaning the table? Yeah, think again. Those eggs are going to last, along with Ascaris eggs. All right, so eggs can survive for a week in moist air. Moist air, they desiccate within a day in dry air. Uh, and I think for the most part, we're in, we're in a drier area. We're probably less likely to ever see a pinworm, you know, a significant pinworm uh, outbreak. Most common route of infection is actually hand to mouth. So fecal to hands to mouth. All right. Uh, and that could come about through you know, improper hygiene, scratching, and then clean, cleaning and not, not washing hands. But you also have contaminated bedding or towels and, and stuff. And that's why also this, this family affair. If somebody in the family has it, chances are everyone's going to have it. And I mentioned these alternate routes of infection. You can inhale it, all right? Inhale it, gets in the lungs, 
mucus of the lungs kind of ciliary action moves it up and then you cough and swallow it. That's a, that's a route. Uh, picking of the nose can also get it there. So you're not, unless you're eating the boogers, all right, get them in the nose and then you can potentially swallow some of that. And I think it's kind of interesting that Caucasians seem to be more susceptible than other races. And I didn't mention this, but this is also seems to be true for hookworm infections. That Caucasians are more susceptible to exhibiting severe symptoms, severe disease signs with hookworm infection. So, you know, host genetics isn't affecting just like bacterial or virus infections. If we, we can hear that with the uh, with COVID virus. All right, certain blood types seem to be less likely to be infected or to exhibit these, these significant morphologies. Well, this is also extending in uh, to, to parasites as well. So, kind of seems interesting. So that's our epidemiology. Let's talk about pathology. You ready? All right, pathology is pinworm disease, also called enterobiasis. So enterobius, enterobiasis, makes sense. All right. One third of the infections are asymptomatic. This is not like a, it's not gonna cause a significant amount of disease. But when we do get it, when we do get some symptoms of disease, usually it's caused by damage of the worm, uh, by damage. Uh, it's going to be damage of the worm and then also damage through like scratching, so micro abrasions from the scratching. So on the worm side of things, uh, the worms are going to feed on uh, epithelium and they're going to cause small micro tears. That could lead to secondary bacterial infection. Now, low infections, low intensities of infections won't cause major major issues, but uh, you know, a lot of them just kind of the build up, you know, the, the amount of damage that, that gets done could, could produce some significant symptoms. Then you have scratching of the anus or perianus. Uh, basically, female worms cause a tickling sensation and irritation causes you to scratch. That can cause uh, micro abrasions. You know, fingernails cause micro abrasions. And again, you're opening up wounds for a possibility of secondary infection. When you do exhibit, these symptoms, or when you do exhibit symptoms of infection, what, what do you get? Well, nervousness, restlessness, um, irritability, those are all tied to just not getting a super great night's sleep. You're constantly being roused uh, because of the irritation of the, those female worms coming out. So, you know, that's kind of nervousness, restlessness, irritability. You just tend to be a little bit more fatigued. You can have loss of appetite. You can have nightmares. Again, nightmares and insomnia because you know this is like it's in your your mind. You think something's there, but nothing's there. You don't. You can't see the pinworms. You don't see the pinworms. Uh, bedwetting is kind of interesting. I think maybe that that's something with the kids. Uh, grinding of the teeth again, kind of stress stress out. But then you also have the perianal pain, nausea, and vomiting. I think nausea, vomiting, and the loss of appetite are all tied to it. Hey, your, your immune system's fighting this. You've got these micro abrasions. You have inflammatory responses. These are all kind of things that are, are associated with inflammation. Females that are infected have the possibility of the worms not only exiting, but then re-entering into the, the vagina. So they don't go back into the anus. All right, this again is gonna cause some mild irritation, some inflammation, uh, but nothing, that, nothing like some of the other parasites that we have seen or some of the parasites that we will be seeing. And then you also have this thing called pinworm neurosis. So this is psychological. Yeah, it gets to the point where if someone knows that they have pinworms or they had pinworms or they children have pinworms, sometimes it could lead to just very excessive cleaning. 
you're, you're completely obsessed about making sure everything stays clean so that we don't get pinworm again. And they, they have a name for this, pinworm neurosis. So. But is there even a way to clean? Is there like a resistance to the disinfectant? Yeah, so e even, I mean, they're going to desiccate even in a, in a more humid environment. They're going to desiccate in about a week without moisture. So, I mean, eventually they'll, get, they'll, they'll go down. But, you know, hot water, you know, you do laundry, you know, the dryer is going to kill them off. I mean, they're, they're susceptible to heat. So, yeah, normally you, you get treated. Pinworms, so named, check out their tail. You'll see the tail. Very characteristic. All right, ready? We've got one more, one more worm uh, to talk about, and this is camelane. So we are in the family camelanidae. Uh, we have, we present this because we do have, we do have some samples of camelanus. These are non-human worms. Right. Morphology of, of these camelanids, they have conspicuous phasmids with broad cavity, cavities and prominent pores. So. You know, we have phasmids. We talked about amphids and phasmids. Phasmids are at the, on the tail. All right, these are the prominent. You could, you could usually see them fairly easily. Uh, on like low scanning electron uh, microscopes. But what's even more obvious is the buccal capsule. So the buccal capsule is modified into a pair of valves, all right? You could say kind of like, like a clamshell type valve. So hookworms, the buccal capsule was modified into the cutting plates and the cutting teeth, all right? And it's just like a single one where they can kind of grasp and tear. This one, it's more clam-shaped because it's going to allow the worms to kind of get in onto the gut epithelial and then clamp down and hold them in place. So the buccal capsule is a pair of large bilateral sclerotized valves so that the hold fast makes it act like a clamp. So this is, this is one view. This is the, like the ventral view looking through it. This is one side. You can't see the, the back side or the front side of it, however you imagine. If we look at it from the side, you can see now these two capsules that act like a clamp. Now between them is this tridentate structure, which again, you have to see it on per, in pro, while the worm's in profile, but it's acting, again, as a site of muscle attachments so that the buccal capsule can clamp and hold down. It's very important for these guys because they're going to have to hold on, uh, hold on to the host while they're dropping their eggs, or while dropping their J-lines. All right, so the example is Camelanus oxycephalus. This is a parasite of freshwater fish and turtles. Right? We have it in our area here. That's why we have some of these, uh, some of these worms. These worms require copepods as an intermediate host. So they come out, they go to copepods, and then the copepods transmit. Right? And what we're going to do is go through the life cycle. All right, you ready? We will put this up here. Right, Camelinus oxycephalus. Our adult is here. Is going to live in rectum and the large intestine. All right, so they are in an area where fecal matter is going to be thick moving through. All right. So our worm is only going to partially leave right, 
right, so our posterior end of the worm is going to protrude out of the anus or cloaca. And this is our female worm. All right, so in the fish, it's going to be, you know, just kind of in the fish and in, in your turtles, basically the cloaca, cloaca is a shared genital pore, a urogenital pore, but they're basically leaving. So they're remaining attached into the rectum. They're letting the back half end extend out into the water, where the water now is going to cause the body wall to rupture. And once they do that, now we have our J1s that are free in the water. Right? J1s are going to be free in the water. These J, so it's not an egg that comes out, it's a J1. J1 then gets consumed by the copepod. where inside the copepod, the J1 will burrow out of the gut into the hemocele, molt to the J2, molt to the J3. Right, so we are in the hemocele. All right. We will then have that copepod be consumed. Make sure you leave yourself room over here. By a fish host, where we have our J3 in the intestine. We will molt to the J4, then molt to our adult. So this would be an appropriate fish host. And we have several appropriate fish ho hosts, perch, sunfish, crappie, bass, etc. So the ones we have, I think, came from crappie and came from turtles. But not all of these, not all of the fish that are out there, especially the ones that are actively feeding on copepods, are going to serve as an appropriate host. All right? So... Sometimes we will get consumed by an inappropriate host. And what this means is it's inappropriate in the sense that that host cannot serve as a definitive host. So our inappropriate fish host will consume the copepod, will have the J3 in the intestine, and then the J4, it'll grow up, molt, to the J4 stage, where it just basically hangs out until it gets consumed by a larger fish, which then molts into our adult stage. So inappropriate fish host I'm going to use is shad, because shad serve as a forage fish for some of our larger game fishes, especially out at Nasworthy. Shad are likely serving as an intermediate host, at least transmitting our copa, transmitting our camelanus to some of the larger crappie. All right, 
Now, we're going to point out Chad, in this case, are serving both as an intermediate host and a peritonic host. So they're serving as an intermediate host because we are getting some development to the J4 stage. And now we're ready, once we get into that next host, to molt to the adult stage. <clears throat> but it doesn't have to get to the J4. Shad can be consumed right after it eats a copepod, has this J3, when they get consumed, that J3 now matures into the J4 in the appropriate hosts and so forth. So our shad, when you think about, a, a let's say, a crappie, a crappie that's that big, the cra that crappie is not eating copepods. But they are eating smaller shad that are consuming the copepods. So in that sense, then, these shad are serving as a peritonic host. They're bridging that gap between our copepods and our larger appropriate fish. This is pretty cool. So we have this Camelanus out in Nasworthy. Um, Nasworthy, we know, um, kind of goes through some cycles on the size of shad that are out there. So normally when you get stunted fish, stunted crappie, you're dealing with an inadequate food supply. The shad are too large. And if the shad are too large to be consuming copepods, then... Um, you might be altering some of the prevalence of this camelanus in that fish host. So there's, there's a lot of things to really consider here. Any questions? I forgot to move this over. Open that up. There's our camelanus life cycle. Feel free to pause it to get it down. All right. So, all right, the life cycle, Stromberg and Frights, that's where I pulled from. Uh, shad are serving as an intermediate host because some development will occur, but it's also a peritonic host because it's bridging that gap to get to uh, get the worm to the larger, larger piscivorous fish. This is a mosquito fish, a species of Camelanus sticking out. That's the posterior. They feed on blood, epithelial tissue, so they do take on this reddish color. That's the food from the host, but the back half sticks out. Body wall ruptures. What happens to the female at that point? She does. Body wall ruptures. So they release the J1s, they die. So in heavy infections, yeah, you'll get some abdominal bloating, wasting, some disinterest in food. Um, does this happen out in the wild? Maybe. Uh, but, you know, we know this because of the aquarium trade. You know, the pet fish trade. Sometimes some of these fish come in with, with camelanus. All right, if you don't spot these worms, uh, then you, know, you could build up a heavy infection. And the, a different species of camelanus doesn't necessarily require the copepod, uh, so the J1s can actually be consumed themselves. Uh, and you could get some heavy infections leading to bloating, disinterest in food, and wasting. But in the aquarium trade, you could treat them and kill off the worm. All right. Leave that up as I get the next presentation ready. Are Strom Stromberg and Crites or Crites the people who discovered this parasite? They described the life cycle of the parasite. Yep, we have access to it. I think it's the Journal of Parasitology. So. All right, we get on this. So we do have specimens of Camelanus. So we'll check out. Check them out in the lab. Next up. What is that? What's sticking off to the side? Oh, there it is. All right. Our last group of nematodes. These are the tissue dwellers. 
think that was ever. Yeah. 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 Tissue drivers. So if you needed one, they'd bring it and the extras. All right, tissue dwellers. These are going to be the nematodes that live outside of the GI tract. All right. So anytime you live outside of the lungs and the GI tract, we're going to have problems. And that problem is getting the eggs or the larval stages outside of that host. See, if you live in the, in the lungs... Or if you live in the GI tract, it's as simple as just dropping your eggs. If you're in the lungs, a ciliary action takes it up, you cough and swallow, and then you can ex you know, expel the eggs that way. Or if you're in the, the intestinal tract, even in the stomach, the eggs just pass out with the feces. That's pretty easy. But if we're outside of those locations, we've got a problem that we have to solve. We have to get, we have to get out those transmission stages out of the host. The solution for this problem depends on where we are. All right, so if we are a worm that are subsurface, just underneath the, the surface of the skin, then what we could do is cause the skin to rupture, and thus your eggs or larval stages can escape that way, or we just remain in that surface and rely on a hematophagous insect to come by, feed on blood or tissue fluid, and then pick up our transmission stage that way. If we are deeper in the body, all right, so not like subsurface of the skin, if we are deeper, then we've got two options. One, return to the surface. Get back to the surface where you could then deposit the eggs of the larval stages. And it's thought that this could possibly be the ancestral path for any of those deeper tissue type nematodes. The other option, though, is to develop a larval stage that circulates in the blood and the tissue fluid and thus rely on some sort of blood feeding insect to pick up and transmit the parasite between hosts. So the somatophagus insect is a blood feeding insect. Insect, that's what it is. They're going to come bite and feed feed on blood and tissue. And we're going to talk about these. Different evolutionary pathways. Different solutions to similar problems. Ready? All right. We're going to start in the family Draconculidae. This inhabits the tissues of reptiles, birds, and mammals. And our example species is Dracunculus metanensis. This species, Dracunculus, is also called the fiery serpent and the guinea worm. We find this in Africa, India, and the Middle East. And it's one of the largest nematodes. Our females can grow up to 80 centimeters in size. Now, when we have infections in humans, the majority of them occur in the lower limbs, so like in the legs. They don't, they're not necessarily restricted just to those areas. Most of them are in the lower limbs. So you'll see with the life cycle, when we, when we have one of these infections, what you're going to have to do is try to Pull the female worm out slowly. If you try to yank them out, you're going to break the worm, and now you're going to cause a pretty significant inflammatory response. So what you do is you take a small stick, a matchstick perhaps, and you take some of the worm that's sticking out, and you wrap it around a stick, and you pull out a few centimeters every day. Hence we have the rise of Asclepius. 
the serpent wrapped around a rod, probably where this came, this, this, that idea came from, or at least the, how, why, how this came about, this image came about from Dracunculus. All right. So there has been a concerted effort to eradicate this parasite. In 1986, we had 3.5 million people were infected with the parasite. Uh, it was endemic in 20 countries. In 2004, we only had 16, a little more than 16,000 cases. In 2019, we have 54 cases across four to five countries. And that fifth country may have been an imported case, so it might not even have been acquired in that country. So you can see, we've really done a great job of knocking this out. All right. So, if we're ready, let's go through the life cycle real quick. Where is this? All right, Dracunculus metanensis. I've got five minutes. That should be enough, hopefully. going to occur in a skin lesion. All right, it's going to be in a skin lesion, as we'll talk about. The blister or the lesion forms about 10 to 14 months post-infection, so after you get it. All right, forms this lesion. This blister, where that female is, and then the blister is going to rupture. Now, the blister's not going to rupture first. Rather, the body wall of the worm is going to rupture, releasing a bunch of J1s. You're going to get this inflammatory response. It's going to expand, and then the skin's going to rupture. All right? Now, Pathology associated with this is kind of a burning sensation. So individuals are going to try to apply some cool water to that. That cool water stimulates muscle contraction in the worm. It stimulates muscle contractions in the worm that further help to push out all of these J1s into the water, all right? So into the water where we, we saw it, all right? J1s are going to be consumed by the first intermediate host, which is a copepod, all right? Inside our copepod, we're gonna have J1 molts to the J2 stage, molts to the J3 stage, all right? All of this in the hemocele. All of this in the hemocele. So just like our camel is, J1 burrows out of the gut, gets into the hemocele, and then develops this. All right. This takes about two weeks, but it's temperature dependent. So it's about two weeks when we're at 25 degrees Celsius. So in the 70s, mid 70s. But we have to get to that J3 stage before we are infected by our host. Humans, what possibility of a dog? I thought about that. But humans are the primary host, and there's some interesting things as to why we haven't completely eliminated them yet. But humans are gonna drink water that has the copepods. We will accidentally consume the copepods. That releases the J1 in the gut, and now we have to get out of it. So our J3 is going to penetrate into the abdominal muscles. Okay. 
They're going to penetrate to the abdominal muscles, and then they will move, penetrate into the subcutaneous tissue or subcutaneous connective tissue. And then they will migrate up to the axillary and inguinal regions. All right, so axillary is armpit. The inguinal is the growing region. And this is still in the subcutaneous connective tissue. So we get to the subcutaneous connective tissue, and then they migrate through that to get to either the armpit region or the groin region. Here now, we will start to mature. So we will molt to the J4. And that's about 20 days after you get infected. And then this will molt to the adults, to the adult stage. All right. So it takes about another 20 days to get to the adult stage. Now, with our adults, the males will die at three to seven months and then degenerate. So they mate, they do their job, then they die and they degenerate and our immune system clears it out. The females will continue to grow and produce a bunch of eggs. All right, so fertilization is happening in about three months. So then it's the females that ultimately are going to be migrating. So once they are ready to release the larval stages, they're going to migrate. And that migration takes place about eight to 10 months. Post-infection. Now they're going to get to that blister and they're not going to start forming the blister immediately, but they're going to get there. Okay. Not terrible. My watch says two minutes over. So, but that's our life cycle. And what I want you to, to realize is that the pathology is going to play a pretty big role. That pathology, that burning blister is going to make individual seek out water. And if that water has copepods growing in there, we have the potential of transmitting it to there. Alright? And we need that cold water to kind of help with those muscle contractions to get the J1s into that water. Alright? So what we will do is we may finish up all of the nematodes on Wednesday. So we'll talk briefly about the pathology of this how we've nearly eliminated parasite, and then we've got Wuchereria, and we have Dyrofilaria. So at least in the labs, we're gonna look at all of those parasites. And we'll decide on Wednesday how much of it we're gonna cover. How much gets covered on the exam. All right, I'll see you in lab. Don't forget to send me the, uh, your presentations.